Your three worst enemies in the Christian life are the world, James 4.4, 4, the flesh, Galatians 5.17, and the devil, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. There's so much to know about these enemies that we will take three lessons to study them carefully. Today, we'll study the world. James 4.4 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is the enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. The world system is controlled by the devil. We see this in Luke chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, when Jesus is being tempted by the devil in the wilderness. Those verses say, And the devil, taking him up into an high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. Now notice that he has all the power and all the glory of all the kingdoms of the world. That's why he is called the God of this world in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Thus when Jesus showed up on the earth, though he was the one who made the world, the world didn't know him. John chapter 1 verse 10 said he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. So Jesus, while he was here, simply tried to save some out of the world, but he did not try to take over the world or change the world. In John chapter 18 verse 36, when Jesus is being questioned by Pilate, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. You know, some Christians get off track here. They think they need to somehow change the world into a better place, more suitable for Christians. That won't happen. Not until Jesus Christ comes back. Then he'll fix all of this in his time when he ends the devil's rule. In Matthew chapter 24, his disciples uh, sat with him on the Mount of Olives, and they came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? You see that? He's going to end the devil's rule over the world when he comes back. He's going to take control of the kingdoms of the world. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15 says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. In the meantime, the world has a very strong influence and a pull on people and on Christians. Just compare the church today to the church a hundred years ago, and you will see the significant increase in worldliness that has infiltrated the church and the Christian home. So let's look at what the world uses to draw your attention away from things of the Lord. All right? It uses, first of all, rudiments. Colossians chapter 2 verse 8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. These are the first principles of any art, like science, the beginning or foundations of any knowledge, the first steps in a process, for instance. And today, these fundamental principles of science in the world, you know what they, they are founded on? They are founded on this one belief, that there is no God. Yet the Bible clearly states, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So rudiments are obviously an enemy of God. There's something else. Worldly wisdom. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, we read this. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You know what? The world's wisdom is absolutely contrary to the Lord's wisdom. 
The Lord's wisdom appears to be foolish to those who believe the world's wisdom. In much modern Christian literature, you're going to find modern psychology backed up by verses from the Bible and marketed as a Bible doctrine. You know what that is? It's nothing more than the world's wisdom in disguise. You better watch out. And then there's another thing, the world's course. In Ephesians 2.2, 2, the Bible describes us when we were lost, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The course of this world moves contrary to the course of God. In order to live for God in this world, you have to go against the flow in the same way that salmon have to swim upstream. The Lord's way is the narrow way, and the world's way is the broad way. What else does the world use? Well, it uses cares, riches, and lusts. In Mark chapter 4, verse 19, we read this, The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. These worldly deceivers will so distract you that you have virtually no time to consider the things of God and to de develop any kind of relationship with Him. What else does the world use? It uses power. In Mark chapter 8, verse 36, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The world allures you into believing that you need to accumulate possessions and assets in order to be successful. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 15, we read this. He said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And then he goes on to speak this parable, beginning in verse 16. He spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided. Suddenly you learn that you've spent your entire life on vain things that cannot profit when your soul slips into an eternity in hell. For a Christian, this allurement will compel him to strive for more earthly power as his supernatural power in Christ wanes to a flicker and he winds up broke at the judgment seat of Christ. Remember when we studied the judgment seat of Christ? 1 Corinthians 3.15 said, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. You know what? You don't want to suffer that loss. So what can we do to defend ourselves? Well, do these things. Recognize that the world as an enemy and is an enemy and don't make friends with it. James 4.4 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So don't befriend it. Don't fall in love with it. In 1 John chapter 2, we read this, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Remember that the world's fashions pass away. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 31, we read, And they that use this world as not abusing it for the fashion of this world passeth away. What else can you do to protect yourself from the world? Separate from it. In James chapter 1, verse 27, pure religion 
and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. What else can you do? Well, set your affections on things above. Colossians 3, 1 and 2 and 3, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. What else can you do? Matthew 6, 20, what? Lay up treasures above. But lay up treasures or for yourselves, treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. He said, is there anything else that I can do to protect myself from the world? Yes, live by faith and not by sight in this world. In Romans chapter 1, verse 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, we read, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. My friend, this world is a vicious, deceitful enemy, and it has permeated the lives of many Christians and most of the churches. Don't be led astray by this worldly tendency. Hold your ground, lest you be overcome by this enemy.